All right, so today I want to look at a paper by Ken Thompson, who was awarded the Turing Award along with Dennis Ritchie back in 1983 for their contribution to the design of operating systems and in particular, the implementation of the Unix operating system. And this paper is actually a transcription of his Turing Award lecture. Now, Thompson chooses to not talk about Unix in his acceptance lecture, but instead address the issue of how can we tell if a program is free of Trojan horses? Now, what does he mean by a Trojan horse? A Trojan horse is a backdoor or a bug that is intentionally inserted into a program, usually for some nefarious purpose. He starts out very innocuously by presenting it almost as a cute hobby, but we'll see that by the end, things get pretty dark. Let's start with the abstract problem of writing a program which, when it is compiled and executed, will output an exact copy of its own source code. This is also called a quine, which is a term coined by Douglas Hofstadter in his famous book, Godel, Escher, and Bach. And just to make things concrete, Thompson gives an example of a quine written in the C programming language. So what's going on in this program? He defines a character array, which is actually a string representing this very program. And then in main, he iterates over that character array and prints it out. Well, to be precise, he prints a few things before and after and also prints this long character array. And when you run this, you will get back the same program. Now, self-reproducing programs like these have a couple of very important properties. The first one is that this program could easily have been generated by another program. And the second one is that since it exactly reproduces its own source code, it could contain an arbitrary amount of payload, so to speak. In this case, even the comment that's inside the program is reproduced. All right, so stage one was how to write self-reproducing programs. Now we move on to stage two, which talks about how to add a new feature to an existing compiler. The compiler for the C language is written in the C language itself. So how can we add a new feature to the C language and then produce a compiler that understands this new feature? He takes a very simple new feature that he wants to add. In C, we have string literals and they understand these escaped characters like slash n, which is the new line. And let's say we want to make the C compiler understand a new escape sequence slash v, which is, let's say, the vertical tab character. So how would we go about doing that? Let's first look at the original source code. This is what the code for the original compiler would look like. It's looking for a slash, it's looking for an n, and so it recognizes slash n. What we really want is to add a clause like this so that the compiler recognizes slash v as well. But there's a problem, which is that since the old compiler does not know about slash v, it cannot compile this new source code. So what we do is, instead of writing it like this, we emit 11, which is the ASCII code for slash v. Now, this code will be compiled without an error by the old compiler which does not understand slash v and the resulting new compiler binary that is produced will start understanding what slash v means at the end of this we can install this new binary as the new official c compiler on the system and now we can go about writing code with this new string feature so that's how we can bootstrap a compiler to understand a new language feature. That was stage two. Now we move on to stage three, where we try to extend this idea even further. Let's say at a very high level, the C compiler has a function called compile, which accepts a string, which is a C program, and then emits its compiled version. 
what would happen if in the source code of the compiler we inserted a clause which would match a pattern and then compile a bug what this means is that we will intentionally miscompile source code whenever a particular pattern is matched within that source code now this is intentional it's not a bug and because it is intentional it's a trojan horse and here comes the final killing stroke which is that what if this trojan horse matched code in the login command and the bug that it emitted would make the login command accept a particular known password in addition to also accepting the legitimately correct password if an attacker were able to pull this off they would then be able to log into any system with an infected login binary now you might object and say that obviously if someone inserted such a blatant bug in the code people would notice and find out but what you could do is insert two bugs so you will match two patterns and install two bugs and this second pattern would be aimed not at the login program but at the c compiler itself so once we have that we can install the buggy c compiler as the official c compiler and now we can actually remove the bugs from the source of the compiler and the new compiler will reinsert the bugs whenever anything is compiled with it the login command will still remain vulnerable but you could revert all the source code that inserted these two bugs the bugs will get propagated by the buggy version of the c compiler so there you have it you have a trojan horse in the login program with no trace in the c compiler source code of how it got there the moral of this entire exercise was to point out how shaky the foundations of our trusted computing base are that you can't really trust code that you did not completely create yourself thomson used the c compiler as an example but he could have carried out the same attack using the same principles on any other program which compiles or executes other programs such as an assembler, a loader, or even microcode on the hardware. In fact, the lower the level at which this bug is inserted, the harder it will be to detect. This was in 1983, so this was just when computers were beginning to be used by the public at large. And Thompson here is making the case that breaking into computers should have the same ramifications as breaking into physical property. Now, in 2005, David Wheeler published a paper which details how such an attack could be detected using a technique known as diverse double compilation. Essentially, it uses another trusted compiler to detect whether a binary has a trojan horse or not but that's a topic for another video so that was ken thompson's turing award lecture on trusting trust i hope you enjoyed that and i will see you next time thank you very much